Hi, everybody. Welcome to La Lista, a Latinx writers podcast. I am your host, Ruben Mendive. Today, we have a brand new guest here. I ask my guests to introduce themselves, so your name and how you identify for the people at home. So my name is Yasmin Morales Campbell, and I self-identify as she, but also identify as Afro-Caribbean, and the one thing that I am, I would say, is ineffable or undefinable. And I know that sounds very full of shit and full of myself, but I don't like boxes, and I definitely don't like being... um, as a writer, I think that's why I like to write because we, we often write outside the box. So where are you from? And like, what's the short version? What's the long version? I was born and raised in the Boogie Down Bronx. Grew up there in the, in the 80s. So it was notorious at the time for Bronx's burning. My father is Puerto Rican, a very proud Puerto Rican man. And my mother is a very proud Dominican woman. And there is this mythology that those two races don't get along. And I would say... They did. They got along enough to have myself and my sisters. And then afterwards, you know, then they inevitably went their separate ways. But it was a beautiful union. And we grew up in a really fun, like very artistic home. My parents were both pretty young when they had me. So my mom actually was a teenager. She she was 17. My dad was old, slightly older, not that much older, like 23, but, you know, still around. But at the time, he was still a very tremendous pillar of the town, which is to say that he had three different uh, businesses. Actually, he, he was a mechanic. He also was a boxing and kung fu teacher. And then he all, he was always actually interested in like what I, I'm just going to call like the dark arts, <laughs> which is just to say that he always did like Santeria and did all that kind of stuff. But he hails from, and you know, our family lineage hails from a, a long line of shamans. And it's not like what people would imagine like the rattle shaking kind of dusty shamans in the desert it's it's more like the cosmological type that kind of sits and meditates in one mind's eye and then like learns to kind of astral project that kind of stuff kind of trippy stuff I grew up in a in a house that was very full of Catholicism um it was very mixed you know growing up in the in the 80s in the Bronx very interesting my mother who it was weird because I grew up in a household where like my two like Hispanic parents, one was a citizen, the other one was never a citizen, right? My, my mom was is a is Dominican. So she came to this country, you know, on an alien visa or whatever. And her rights were very different from my father's rights, and even mine from my own from my father. So it, I, I grew up very conscious of that. And, you know, along with my sisters and everything, distinctly remember, there, there was a big difference between my parents, even, right? Um, even within their own different cultures, as, as Dominic, as a Dominican and a Puerto Rican, you know, like there was a lot of, always a lot of pride on both sides. But um, at least in that time, my dad had like an idea of what he thought his wife should be like, what his, his house, his household should run. <laughs> and my mother, she was a little bit younger than him still, but she was sort of coming out of that feminist 70s. And so I grew up in a very transitional sort of household where my dad was, you know, I don't know, like the machismo thing was there, but my mom was like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. So it was interesting to always kind of be in a very sort of shifting place. I would say the majority of the time it was a harmonious household. And then, you know, it was always filled with very extreme moments. And I think that's what informs sometimes my writing, you know? Like, what brought your, like, family to the Bronx? Like, why settled there? Do you know that story? My mother, for sure, lived in a lot of different places. She lived in in Boston and in Chicago. For my dad, he was just, like, his family was just, like, looking for opportunity and real estate. And because at the time, Bronx was burning and stuff, there was, like, a lot of incentives to have people, like, come in and rehabilitate the area. And I got lost on a tangent, but I was starting to say that my dad was a pillar of the town. He had all these, you know, these great like businesses. And until literally the mafia came in and made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Like they it literally happened like that. They sort of, you know, would come in, beat up my dad, beat up his friends and be like, you can't have your own, you know, you guys are, what do they call them? Like, I, I don't know. I, I, there was like this derogatory name that Italian, uh, Italians at the time used for Latinos or even Afro Latinos and stuff. It, it ended up being that, my dad and a bunch of his friends got so pissed that they basically pushed the mafia out and 
they started their own sort of, well, my, my dad was, I'm not going to say his name, but my dad was a notorious um, drug lord. He grew in power in 1983 and then started to kind of grow on from there until 1989, approximately when the Fed busted him. So the reason that he grew into that power, unfortunately, he was, it's a track that he felt he had to take in order to protect his neighborhood and his family because the mafia was trying to take over and my dad wasn't having it. Him and his friends got together and drove them out and they just kind of, you know, became powerful drug lords because that's the only way that they could protect themselves. The cops wouldn't come, you know, it, it culminated in him being nabbed by the feds. He'd served time. Now he's a televangelist in Puerto Rico. So who knows? Like, he, you could be anything you want. As a writer, that's somewhat was a little bit of the, the reason I had some resistance to all these like gang shows and all this like cartel stuff because I saw how it ripped my family apart. I saw, I lived it. It's not glorified whatsoever. They're always like, those shows are always interpreting like one piece of it. My dad was anything was a little bit more like Tony Soprano. He was very, as a father figure and as like a provider, he was always very prideful of, of uh, being a protector and of, and that's what he really wanted to present to the world. He didn't want to present to the world being a, uh, a, a you know, a gangbanger or the, you know what I mean? Like that's unfortunately like a role he had to take. Um, and, and look, I, I'm not here saying like he had no choice. Of course, he could have made another choice, but I feel like in the moment, you know, with his face against, you know, whatever, like the, the pavement, like that's kind of what he chose. And I think he chose, you know, what he felt was, was, uh, the, you know, the right thing to survive. You know, you utter my dad's name in certain places. They're like, oh shit, like people's ears perk up. They don't mess around. Uh, and I'm very different. I'm a nerd. So like, I'm not. I can, I can write those stories. I lived it. I, you know, but I'm from a very nerdy kind of like perspective. What was it like <laughs> growing up there? Like, and what was the Bronx like? How, how would you describe it to someone, especially at that time? You know, the Bronx is very lively, very lit. It doesn't sleep. I remember being like, I don't know, an eight-year-old kid and walking the streets at nine o'clock, whereas anywhere else that would be unheard of. But people would always, there's always eyes on the street, you know? And if you're a kid, you kind of felt, at least at that time, you felt like you were being, you were so protected because somebody's abuela was watching you no matter what, you know, somebody was watching. Um, there was no cell phones then, but like, you know, the, the, the network was there. There's always eyes and ears. I can't explain it, but like you weren't alone. You were never alone. Somebody's always watching. That means there was a lot of people always hanging out on stoops outside. There was always kids playing, whether with a fire hydrant, you know, they would open it illegally. There was like water splashing. I mean, that's, that's all true, um, especially if it was really, really hot because the, the old brick buildings, they didn't have great insulation. And they definitely, that also goes for the, the summertime, meaning that um, it would get super hot. It's very lively. You know, there's always something going on, whether it's people literally playing dominoes outside or people double dutching, by the way, I'm the, I can't, I can't double dutch. Like I wanted to so bad. I wanted to be cool. I wanted to hang out, but I used to get whipped. I, I can't, I don't have that coordination yet. I'm a drummer. So I don't know what that means. And people were always very like physical. There was a lot of like a lot of karate schools, like a ton of karate schools. Um, we love karate. I don't even, don't even ask me why martial arts is like a thing in, in the Bronx. Um, Cause I grew up in Spanish Harlem. It wasn't just Spanish speakers there. I mean, I had two best friends growing up, Chan and Saran. You know, Chan um, was Chinese and and Saran was Filipino, and um, they were like my they were they were my they were my homies. You know, there were these little <laughs> these little Asian girls that were smart as hell and like they were cool. Like they were hood as hell too, which is like what? <laughs> um, it's very interesting. It's it's not one note. You know, there's every type of person there. There was all kinds of food, all kinds of cuisine. Anything you ever wanted to eat is there is right there. The food is good too. Yeah, and yet it's always depicted as this sort of like downtrodden place. We have a lot of parks. We have a lot of bright murals. You know, a lot of music all the time playing on the streets randomly. You know, from somebody's like either apartment or in their car. People just having little like tiny dance parties, block parties. It was like little like little celebrations. Yeah. So, you know, and of course there was crack vials, you know, <laughs> of course, like that's like a thing, right? That's not a given, but, but at that time, yes, there was a ton of crack vials on the floor. I remember I could like describe them as, as common as like cigarette butts, but, and the colors of them and, 
and cocaine vials and you know it was crazy though but it it was um the most exciting place i've lived in and i've lived in a lot of you know places so like 14 to 18 i frame it in these three questions who were you who were you pretending to be and how did other people see you oh wow so my high school years were in the 90s so i was a nonconformist. i was like this sort of punker like boot wearing like you know I, I also listened to like Nirvana and like you know I you know like Stone Temple Pilots Pearl Jam like I was like a nonconformist Henry Rollins band like I was cool <laughs> I was MTV okay that's what I was I was whatever MTV told me I was but I thought I wasn't that right I thought I was like this, my own person and what's weird is that like I wasn't in the Bronx for my teen years I went I lived in Puerto Rico for a little bit but then my mother moved us to a suburb in New Jersey and that was like such a different change of pace for me because I was exclusively hanging out with white kids and I was like what (laughs) you know I had no idea like the food was different like I legit had to bring my own sazon like packets with me to certain like because oh my god like oh what is this salt and pepper are not the only ideas me on like you are not like you need a little bit more help but like I in high school I, I was this kid living in two worlds you know I was raised by a very strong minded you know, Dominican mother. And at the time she was a single mother then. And so like, I had to always do my duty. I couldn't just go to parties. I couldn't go anywhere without like, you know, helping to clean the entire house for no reason. We did spring cleaning. I don't even know what spring cleaning is. That, that shit happened every day in our house. Cause like, you know, where there is, um, you know, fabuloso. I think my mom, my mom, like, I think she liked me so more than fabuloso, but I don't know. Um, and King Pine, King Pine was her thing. I don't even know. But the thing about it is like, it was a it was it was a time of for sure figuring out who, how, who I was as an American. So that's what I was at, in in high school. It's like, what is it like to be American in America in this time when there were um, your country, right? Or the in, in specifically for me it would be Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic. You know, when they were in utter poverty, right? They were in utter sort of disarray. Was I a fattened American? You know, was I did I have all these and so. What I did, I, I was a nonconformist. So I, it's unfortunate because I, I did hang out with everybody in high school. I did. Like, there were maybe, like, a few, a handful of, like, Hispanics and Latinos in our, in our school. And that's owing to, I, I lived in a very sort of, like, suburban but also, like, farm town in New Jersey, in southern New Jersey. And we had a lot of migrant workers, right, that would come. And that's the first time that I saw what, how horrible colorism is. Because I grew up. My mom's like really dark skin. My my dad is light. So I'm like right in the, in the middle. And I didn't know what like a hava was. Um, I think hava is, is, again, it's like more like slang term and it means like kind of a mix. I, I just kind of, I started to notice that language more when I was in high school when the migrant workers would come and they were like, oh, look at the Indios, they're here. And I'm like, what do you mean they're, what the hell does that even mean? Like they're from, you know, the poorest part of like, you know, the, the Southern you know, Hispanic country. I'm like, okay, so doesn't that make us brothers? And, and I remember like the stupid conversations around like those Hispanics that were here in America that watched Walter Mercado religiously, that were like hanging out, you know, you know, like watching Univision Telemundo, but there was a lot of racism even against them. But then when the migrant workers came to town, they were racist themselves. And I was mad about that. So what I used to do is I used to put my phone number uh, I used to put it in doctor's offices and in the ER. And if anybody needed a translator, I would come. And I was like, Ruben, I was shocked because I thought, oh, migrant workers speak Spanish. No, a lot of these folks spoke indigenous languages. I had no clue. And there were these beautiful, beautiful people. For me, I thought it was an opportunity to bridge gaps. It wasn't like the racism was real. Colorism was real. That's the first time I really saw it. And I saw the hatred of it. And so in high school, I just kind of dedicated um, my time to being a translator. So I was called a lot by mainly by a lot of mothers with their children. Then I worked for this migrant workers program where like I was a teacher and I taught their children. Or it was like a daycare sort of because we had a lot of farms, a lot of blueberry farms. Um, And then the living quarters were horrendous. Like I never, I never. And I just kind of brought that with me and it it, it informed me. So I was this nonconformist punker girl. I was a wrestler. I was the only girl wrestler in high school and I was undefeated. 
Um, I was the only Latina in the whole thing. Um, I had the biggest wrestler. I, I never fought in their weight class. In high school, I fought 130. I mean, I'm not anywhere near that now. I'm, a, I'm such a fat ass from coronavirus, but like a proud one. What I'm saying is like, I, so I fought 130 weight class in high school. And the reason I say that is because at the time, the boys were still kind of skinny. So I would, you know, I would just wrap my giant muscular female legs around them and kind of pin them. But there were a lot of guys that didn't like that, that I was a wrestler. In fact, a lot of them were like petitioning, oh, we can have her because when we go away to scrimmages, you know, she has to go in first to get dressed and then we go in and that it makes us late sometimes. I'm like, oh, shut the hell up. You know, I'm like, I'll go after. I don't care. So I just remember that the people that rallied around me were my teachers, my, my, the coach himself, and also um, the bigger, older guys who kind of were into this sort of anti, you know, kind of the, the, this, this cool feminism thing that I was doing, whatever it was. I didn't even know I was doing something. I just kind of felt like, I want to wrestle, you know, like I want to, I want to, I want to beat somebody up. I'm like, how come girls, how come we can't do that? And so I just did it anyway. And then I was, you know, I painted a lot of murals and like I was doing that, you know, it was, I was actually getting commissioned in high school to, to, to paint these walls. <laughs> and I was a band nerd. And that was the last thing I was a band nerd. I played drums. What'd you do after high school? Like, was there a plan? Did things go according to plan? Well, I wanted to have a very solid background first. Like, so I, 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 I didn't, I didn't want to, and look, not everybody has to do it this way, but like, I, I wanted to have a degree on something I could fall back on. So what happened was that I got a degree in English, uh, comparative literature, um, and, uh, or excuse me, Spanish, English, comparative literature. And so what that enabled me to do is it enabled me to start working right away. So I wasn't just like, I didn't start to be a writer, uh, you know, not out the gate, like who, like who does that except for like nepotism and like super rich people, but that's not, that wasn't me. So I actually went to be a teacher. I actually was a, became a certified K-12 teacher, which was not something I was thinking about doing immediately, but I remember my time with the migrant workers and their children. And I remember like really impacting and being a resource and being able to source all that. And I didn't know that that's kind of like what writers do anyway. Like we source a lot of, you know, things and we put it all together and then we present it all nicely and in a bow tie. I didn't know that's what I was already doing. So I initially went to college to make sure I had a nice foundation and that I could get a job first that would enable me to um, have enough money so that I could then do what I wanted. And so as I was a teacher in the, in, in the regular school year, in the summers, I would go and I was a PA and I would be a PA on set. Or I would like assist or, or have like, a, you know, do internships. And it's not like you arrive at those things, like knowing exactly how to get in. But I'm like, well, you know, an intrometida, like I'm nosy as hell. Like I will find a way in, you know, I, I will like invite myself in. I would make my, you know what I mean? Like I would like pitch myself until someone's like, all right. Like they'll just be like, okay, we're just gonna let you in. So you can shut up. <laughs> like, I don't care how. But then after that, like the wow factor, like how I wow them, then they're like, oh yeah, you know what? You're right. I, I should let you in like and then they feel stupid for not letting me in to begin with. So like that was always my plan is like to make sure that I had a steady like money. Money has to be steady. If money isn't steady, then, you know, and it sacrifices. It's like, what do I really want? And I got to say sometimes, Ruben, it was pretty degrading because like the sense of um, I think that the sense of like workmanship that, that that collectively that Hispanics and like Latinos that how we're raised, we're raised to work hard as shit. But then I noticed that a lot of people didn't work so hard. <laughs> I noticed that they didn't work as hard as I did. And then I look around and I'm like, oh, what? And then I notice things. I'm like, oh, this person's related to that person, related to that. And then they ask, like, how did you come about? Because when you start out performing people, they want to know who the hell it is that is like the threat. And I'm, I'm, I'm not a little, you know, woman by any means. So I'm loud as shit, too. So like, and if somebody does something stupid and I don't like it, they're going to know, boss or not. You know what I mean? Like. Being a teacher makes you also very organized. Um, and then when I'm a PA, that was like a breeze. I was like, oh, this is nothing. <laughs> this is absolutely easy, you know, an easy ass job. So then very quickly I was promoted. And so like, how would you describe your like your grad school journey? Like, how would you summarize it? What it, what it, what it did for me personally is that it, it showed me that working hard is not the only way that people measure merit. I had to learn that it's relationships. It's also a lot of balance. I think if I would not have gone to grad school and I would have gone from college to work, I would have been just very disappointed in life because I think that one comes out bright eyed and bushy tailed into the workforce from college expecting, well, yeah, you know, all my hard work pays off to this, but not in grad school. In grad school, it is like a miniature kind of like a pre-launching point to the workforce. So 
I immediately saw that it didn't matter how hard I worked. It helped to sort of kind of uh, even the playing field because you had to really impress people with your personality, but also with your resources, with the way that you work with other people. And I think, unfortunately, some folks don't understand that. And then they come out into the workforce prematurely. So, you know, you graduate grad school. Like, what's the next step? Like, uh, right after I graduated grad school, I immediately started seeking internships because at this point, I'm a specialist. So at this point, I feel like I don't have to, you know, necessarily tiptoe around the business. So I went like head first and I moved from back, you know, from the East Coast, moved to California, immediately started working on a movie. But again, it wasn't like, hey, you know, like I, I had to I had to reach into my network. I had to reach out into like the grad school network and reach out to filmmakers. And that's the other thing that grad school gives you really that's kind of different from just regular college. It is a network of, you know, you start off with like a smaller network. And then as you as you, you develop, you know, contacts, I was able to like right after grad school, just reach out to the networks. They kind of hooked me up with with jobs. Um, and of course, it's a lot of there's a lot of proving ground. It's not like, oh, here, here's this chick and she's she's ready to go. No, there, there was a lot of like a lot of false starts, a lot of like, you know, a lot of like promises and this and that. But, you know, you just have to remember that you keep up that you've made a promise to yourself and you have to, you know, complete. You have to accomplish. You have to kind of like go through with that, with that promise to yourself, because even though people are not giving you what you expected, even though you were raised to do what you say, say what you do, you learn quickly that people are not that way. <laughs> Um, and that you have to continue to push through with with that sort of integrity. So that's what I did. I, I just kind of kept talking to more people, uh, or first to my network, and then meeting more people. And that's kind of what it is. It's always been like that. It, it is a word of mouth business, and that's how you get your job. Um, and also, you know, if you're really good at your, you know, at your craft as a writer in particular. So I, I took a look at your bio, did some research, and have seen that you have like I couldn't believe some of the the places you've worked. So, so how can you just like summarize for us, like your entertainment career journey thus far? When I came to the business, you know, I'm a woman of color, clearly, but I didn't feel like I could just jump in and be a writer. It wasn't my, pa- it wasn't like the doors weren't opening. People didn't even, you know, I wasn't even, the rooms didn't even look like me at all. And so I, I came from a place of serving. So I was like, who do I want to serve? Like, who, what are some of the mm. tremendous people that I want to work with? And I'm like, you know what, even before that, I'm going to back it up. I'm like, I really don't understand this business. I, by total fluke accident, sort of like landed uh, at ICM, right? So ICM is International Creative um, Management, but now it's technically International Creative like Talent. There's a lot. They're, 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 it's like bigger now. But basically, I landed at an agency. And the fun thing about working at an agency is that you get like a bird's eye view of like all the different facets of every area of the entertainment industry. So it was wonderful working there. In particular, I worked in the motion picture literary department. So um, I didn't work in in the TV side. The TV side, you know, TV and and movies, um, uh, while they're like similar, they're they're very different, very different entirely um, business, you know, from business structure. So I learned from, you know, top agents, top, top talent. It was great. Like what was at stake? I learned from a very safe vantage point about, you know, I was on a lot of phone calls with like huge executives and other writers who were like just pouring their heart and soul out. I learned also from working with writers directly, like, and I mean like writers that had like huge hits already, like, like that it wasn't, it, 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 the facade was that, you know, you got on the red carpet and you and, and, and Brad Pitt have a house next to each other and all this other crazy shit. And it's not that at all. It was very... And I don't, and I was never enamored by that side of Hollywood. I just love telling stories. And I think that's because of the shamanism um, and, you know, it's a celebration of humanity and people. And I always was very inter- innately interested in humans. And so, and I actually thought I was going to be an anthropologist for a while also, because I love people and I love story, but um, which is why I love that you are, you know, that you interview, but you're are also a writer. You know what I mean? Like, it's cool. It's all one and the same. And so like when I was at, at ICM, I, I learned about what aspects of the business I was weak in or needed to know more about. And so eventually I got coached uh, by Overbrook Entertainment, which is, you know, they're now, you know, they're, they're now Westbrook, but Overbrook is Will and Jada's company. And they're really multifaceted. They do a lot of philanthropic work. You know, some people know about it. Most don't, unfortunately, but they, it's not just what they call a glamour deal or, a, a, you know, 
it's it's not just that it's because it's run by those two, but they are they work really hard and they have a lot of like business partners that work very hard, um, you know, to give back to the community. Um, and so I got to see like what it takes, like all the sacrifices and all the intense work. Like it's nonstop. The work is nonstop. So again, from a very safe vantage point, not only did I learn the ins and out of the business, you know, from from working at an agency. Um, then I got very close, up close and personal over at Overbrook, what, what it was called at the time, and got to work in development, reading a ton, a butt ton of scripts, doing coverage. And that's the one thing, like, the one thing I, that I will say, the one piece of advice is learn how to write coverage. Learn how to write coverage, because if you read a script and you can synopsize it and make it tight and then, like, synopsize it in a page or in five pages, depending on how they want the breakdown, then once you get out there and you're writing your own script, and once you're out there and, and then you can pitch, you could pitch amazing. Like you, if you can distill it, you could write amazing log lines, just read scripts and then learn how to write coverage. Like there's a lot of, um, and so what is coverage? You know, coverage is basically like you take a script, you read all of it, like you summarize it really succinct, but also hopefully with, um, with a voice and the tone of, of the script. So if it's like an action thriller, you're not going to just kind of like, summarize it as flat and boring as possible you're going to put like a lot of interesting you know um descriptive descriptions in it and you're going to kind of make it roll you're going to make it you know kind of fun so make so do coverage because coverage is going to serve you first um because you're serving like whoever you're reading for or or if you're in development but eventually it'll serve you as a writer um but anyway so i was poached because i used to write tremendous coverage but that's because i was a writer i was a closeted writer i didn't think i was in any position to be like guess what guys i'm a freaking amazing writer you know and and i and the truth is I, I don't even think i was yet you know actually i know i wasn't like some of my old scripts i'm like oh god so embarrassing to like um even read but um but after i did that i uh again stayed sort of within the sony company because they were sort of at sony for a long time um overbrook was and so then i worked with uh laura ziskin the late laura ziskin just an amazing producer uh a badass female producer she just you know changed the business in so many profound and deep ways and everybody who's ever worked with her just you know she just gave like the the strongest and coolest advice she started out as a an assistant to Barbara Streisand and then she kind of rose from there she just has such a tremendous sort of prolific uh career and she unfortunately passed away from cancer but in her legacy she's also she also uh started the foundation stand up to cancer um and so Every time I look back on the places that, uh, that I've always attracted to working and the people working with, they were always folks that gave back to the community. So that to me is something that was like philanthropy is, um, is like one in the same in our business. It's like you're trying to make the world a better place. You're trying, whether you're a producer, a writer, a director, you're trying to tell a story that impacts humanity, right? And hopefully that impact will, you know, be a positive one and a learning one. But then after, so then after, you know, Laura Ziskin, I, I worked for Michael Phillips. He's, he's the best. Like, I still keep in touch with him. Michael Phillips runs a company called Lighthouse Productions. And he's an Academy Award winning producer. He did Taxi Driver, The Sting, Close Encounters with a Third Kind. And he's married, you know, to the famous Julia Phillips, um, or was married to her. He's like a very, he's like a perfect amalgamation of like, so I, I learned a lot of things from him, right? The, it, like so many things. He's known to be like this really big sci-fi producer and I love sci-fi. So it was like such a, it was such a treat working, you know, working with him. And um, he taught me like so many things. Like I thought I was being honest, you know, whenever I was talking to writers and we're developing ideas, if I told them how I felt about their content and he goes like, no, 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 no. He goes like, I want you to, every time you have, if you have something that you're going to say that's criticizing, make sure you offer um, something that's positive, like, and it's not that I wasn't doing that. I think I was just kind of more trying to be helpful or thinking I was being helpful by like offering my opinion. But he said, no, 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 always offer. I want you to always offer like a solution. And because he's, he's like, this is why, because if you know that you can't offer a solution, then that kind of slows the slow, it'll slow you down. It'll give you a little bit more humility because you'll be able to see it's not as it's easier said than done. It's like, go try to do that. Try to make that work happen and give those. And so he made me such a better development person because he's like an incredible producer, you know, incredible producer. Um, and to this day, he's very supportive of me. He reads my stuff. He, you know, um, he's just a supportive human being. And then I also work for Lawrence Bender. He is such a hard worker. 
Um, and I don't know how he would feel about me even talking about it, but he's, again, just like Michael, though, I, I mentioned this about Michael, but Michael was so, um, like, equally, he was very balanced. So was Lawrence. They're really good dads. Like, that's what I also noticed. I'm like, these guys are like, how, did, how are they parents at the same time? Because I'm a parent, but like, they're parents. They're like hands on in their kids' business about school. Like, that's the one thing that they both taught me. It's like, this business is great, work hard. They were, and they wake up early and they do yoga, both of them. <laughs> they do yoga at like at crazy hours in the morning. And I'm like, what's yoga? What is this thing? Is this like a California? Like, what am I going to do out here? Like, I don't get it. Like, eventually, I, many years later, I would get into it. And I could see why, because you do need a break in your brain to kind of chill it out and to kind of integrate with all the hysteria that's happening around you in a day. And you need to kind of, you know, because I feel like the, 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 the speed of Hispanics and Latinos, it's like we are used to kind of moving so quickly um, that sometimes some of us forget to kind of bask and chill. And so I learned a lot of great things. I had different stints at studios, you know, because I, I, I would either go freelance and, you know, worked in marketing, learned a lot of things. But I would say it was my time in development that really taught me about the interactivity and, and excuse me, the interactions of people um, and also taught me what I would be, you know, like the things I really liked as, a, as a being a writer. It really behooves you as a writer to know more writers that you can grab, you know, a list of, of, of people immediately that would be able to match the tone of your show or be able to help you build this, build this amazing ship that you're, that you're building. And it's unfortunate because I think that the, that a certain generation of writers, which is to say maybe like a generation older than us, I think that they feel differently. I think they, that some of them feel that they're all like, you know, uh, individuals and, and they don't form this camaraderie, you know, like even this opportunity to talk to you on this podcast, you know, I've certainly listened to your podcast. I've certainly learned. Um, there's a lot of writers out there I didn't know exist and it has nothing to do that they're not tremendous and great. It's just that unfortunately, you know, we're underexposed sometimes or our, our stories haven't been kind of pushed out there, but I always, I'm in a position where I'm interested in learning about humans and people. And I, and I, and, and uh, that's why I was always um, able to work with these wonderful folks. Um, some, I can't even say who I've worked with because you sign a lot of NDAs and things or at which capacity, meaning like I've co-developed certain things. So I've sometimes just taken a paycheck to take in credit on screen credit of certain, you know, big works that are out there. But, I think I did that because I, I, one, I wasn't necessarily ready to expose myself in that way as a writer. And then the other part is, it's not the story I wanted to tell. And I think now, now there are these stories and we're all rallying around each other. Um, and I think that's what's important is to also really recognize that we all have stories worthy of telling. Maybe they may not be like the story that you resonate with, but it's a story worthy of telling. And so I'll support that story, you know? When did the writing come in? Like when it was something you knew you enjoyed? Can you take us through like the whole journey of like liking writing, enjoying it, deciding to study it, and then like in your words, exposing yourself as a writer? I love story. I, I loved reading. I was an, a, a voracious reader as a kid. I literally was that kid in the never ending story movie where like under like a blanket, like under a, uh, with a thunderstorm in the background, you know, like reading like with a, flashlight like a total crackhead and I, had, I was always reading books um and I don't know why I was reading it but I think I my mind needed to escape honestly looking closely maybe it could be because of you know I lived in the Bronx and there were always sirens or gunshots in the background or whatever so I was always escaping through a book and so I was a voracious reader and so I always had access to this this tremendous language and the best part is that you know, mo most of us, not all of us, because even some of my, a couple of my sisters don't speak Spanish, but I was fortunate enough that I learned Spanish growing up. So I could read in Spanish as well. And that's a whole nother level of, 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 you know, beauty and exposure. And so I was always a reader first, did, did well academically in that place, in that space, um, kind of breezed through high school English. Um, and, and it's funny because I, I also know writers that are, were terrified of writing. They're very damn good. Um, so for me, it was more about access to the language, right? Access to the richness, the things, how you could turn the turn of a phrase. Like that is like the thing I really love to do. But plus, to be honest, like it also serves my family because I was the only one in my family that was a 
basically a native English speaker. Like I, I grew up, I was born here in the country. And so when my mom needed a letter written, when my grandmother needed a letter written or whenever they needed like a translator in English or something in, in like, if we were like in the medical doctor's office, that was me. I, as young as like seven years old, I remember like talking to the doctor about what my grandmother was going through. And I think like we're kind of thrusted into that space. And so like being like a decoder, that's a, that's a writer. So I'm a writer um, uh, by, by, I think by exposure, by creativity, but also by culture. <laughs> I was like, okay. So I was always observing around me. And so it's, it, at first it started off as a, being a voracious reader, helping out my family. Then it became more personal to me. Um, in high school, and I started journaling a little bit deeper. And again, I didn't realize that what I was doing is going to therapy, right? I was doing self therapy. But then, like, then I started to sort of from journaling exactly chronicling what I what I was going through. I was like chronicling the things that I wish had happened, and then that kind of felt very cathartic. I'm like, oh snap! Like this is my own narrative, you know. And then I'm I'm blessed and gifted with the ability to also draw. So I would do like my own weird comic books and sort of it grew it grew there it kept growing and growing ultimately in college being a comparative literature major you know that's super nerdy that's like you know how are all these literatures like interrelated and you know how do you compare you know so that was super fun this again more decoding more decoding learning about an ancient text and how the ancient scholars even knew about things that were happening today and how that kind of you know is all interrelated which is fun but then eventually you know, because of the turn of the phrase thing, that's what landed me my job at ICM is like my the agent I was working under is like, you wrote an incredible thank you letter to me. Like, it was very personal. He's like, that's kind of what it takes in this business. You've got to sell it. You got to pitch the shit out of it. And you know what? I realized I left out a big, big chunk, not a big chunk, but a big like fact about myself as a kid. So when my dad went to jail, my mom was like left all alone with us. And so she had to, she had to go to work. And sometimes we didn't have food in the house. So I would go panhandle as a kid. And I realized that I, that's no different when you're like a writer and you're pitching yourself and you're literally out there like, yo, so he, I got this for you and I could do this. And so I realized that I have absolutely no filter and no fear when I'm pitching whatsoever. But it's because, unfortunately, panhandling helped, helped me. It helped me a lot, you know, like, and it's very dangerous to do that as a little girl, as a little girl on the street. I, I, so I started from a place of like, and then development, then you're helping other people to kind of articulate their ideas and to streamline them. But it's also about strategizing. And that's what I really learned in a really tremendous way, not only at ICM from these amazing, amazing agents, these amazing business people, but also from my old bosses, right? The strategy of a day, like you have, you can just like, you know, it sometimes feels, it sucks. Cause like when you're creative, like you want to work on what you want to work on, which you should, but then you should always you know, I, I'm not even playing. I keep a, a notebook only strictly for strategizing. Like if I have like five or four things that I'm working on and I don't work on things at the same time. Like I used to be, that was like a, a novice mistake I used to do. Not anymore because it affects tone. But like, if I have an idea of something that I know I want to work on in the future, I'll just write it down in this notebook specifically for strategy, right? Like, oh, I'd like to go out to this talent element, or I'd like to maybe work with this specific producer because you know, they literally said this in a podcast or like in an interview that really sparks to the idea that I have. And I think that, you know, it could be a collaborative sort of like, you know, meeting point or whatever. And so like the strategizing is so, so key to being, to being a successful, like actual working writer. And so it was weird because it, it, you know, it went from like being a voracious reader to, you know, journaling for myself to like, oh, writing my own sort of narrative and how I think things could have gone. So it all being very cathartic to then, you know, helping other people articulate their ideas, being a development person. And then it became, again, it became like full circle. I'm like, okay, now here's the stories I'd like to tell for myself. Um, and But I still am very active in other people's development of their own stories. And I still am a connector to other people because it's all, I think it's all the same thing, right? It's all, you know, it, it, if you're not writing it, you're helping somebody to tell their story. So I think it's, it's all good either way. Yeah. And, you know, sort of how you got on my radar was that you were part of the NHMC scrapewriter program. So like, what was the motivation to apply to that? Like, how was the experience? You know, I have to say Brenda was my motivation. And Brenda, you know, for those of you that don't know, Brenda Castillo, she's um, tremendous. She's now the CEO of the National Hispanic Media Coalition in NHMC. You know, for me, like philanthropy is 
you know, goes hand in hand. It's not the flashy parts of like the business, you know, for me that, you know, it, it was always like, how are we building this ship and how are we making it better for the future? And Brenda is that person through and through. Um, she's either, and it's funny because like, I just remember, you know, and there are a lot of other great organizations, you know what I mean? Like Nali, but there's so many, there's so many that are out there to really support us, you know, and say what you will of individuals within those organizations or like maybe it didn't turn out the way you want to say what you will about that. But like as overall, the fact that we have these organizations is a tremendous for our community. Just imagine a world not having them. So Brenda was, um, is somebody who just really cared a lot about the Latino vote. You know, that's very congruent to me. Also about the representation of Latinos. Um, obviously, you know, and I should also say like Imagen, the, you know, the Imagen Foundation is also out there. It's really great. But these folks, and in, 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 in specific like Brenda, she is, you know, dism- single-handedly dismantling um, a lot of the horrific sort of ways that certain, certain old studios, you know, see Latinos. There's a lot of shows that have been canceled. They greenlight like one Latino Hispanic show every once, I don't know, like every other year, maybe even once one a year. And then it lasts like they give us a shitty time slot and then it lasts like a season. And then the problem is that even the creators or creatives are not giving given full latitude of the story they want to tell within it. So the stories are usually whitewashed or usually disingenuous or not 100 percent. Because it's like you're teaching a kid to ride bike, but you're not like letting go of their handle. You're kind of like pushing them the entire way. And then like, it's, it's, it sucks. It's like not the best, you know, model. I, I, I think I previously, I think I, it was like one year I, I, I applied to the NHMC show, Latin showcase and I submitted something that was too long. I think it was supposed to be like one or two pages and I'm, I'm like so freaking verbose. I sent something that was like 10 pages, something crackheaded. I was like, but don't you like it? And then I think I got something back that was like kind and like, oh, this is wonderful, but like it's kind of long, well, you know. I was like, okay. So then I was discouraged, and I was like, yeah, forget it. I'm just gonna keep writing. And then one year, um, I, you know, Brenda, Brenda personally called me because we know each other because we are both out there in the trenches. I, I love to, um, be supportive to an HMC when I can. And she's also equally as supportive too. Um, it's called Inner Voices. And what it is, it's, it's, it's like a, tra- it's a travel, not like it is a traveling career day. And I invite, usually, we usually invite schools from disenfranchised or so-called disenfranchised neighborhoods. And we, um, put together, um, a list of, you know, studio heads, network heads you know, executives, name writers, and then they sit down and they hash it out. They just talk to kids, whether they're interested in movies or not, and just kind of make them aware of the possibilities, how to get into Hollywood, just to talk to them, like, like real people. But these are like names, like name talent talks to them. But, you know, and HMC is supportive of that too. So like we have an HMC, you know, we've, we've had, you know, Fox uh, FX, you know, we've had like, you know, uh, uh, you know, other, you know, executives and some other big studios come as well, come through, you know, because the thing is like, Sometimes you don't know, you know, what's possible if you don't see it, right? Like, what is it? Like uh, Gina Davis Institute, she says, you know, if you can't see it, you can't be it. And so like, yeah, Brenda is just like this tremendous force in the business. And it's funny because she always, she has recently said, I'm not in the business, you know? It's like, no, you know, you're for sure like a connector and enabler. You're amazing. One of those things that I, I stayed connected with her and um, and then I got read and then, you know, I, I made it in and I, that was, it felt wonderful to be seen. Right. Um, but then it also wasn't a surprise because of course we see each other and of course we love each other. And I felt that I felt the support there and I, and the program itself was like that, you know, and it was cool that we were all very different from each other, like all of us from each other, you know, from, and we all had different ideas. And we all, you know, contributed to one another's ideas in interesting, profound ways. And you've already interviewed a bunch of the folks from the program, but they're tremendously talented and funny as hell, very reverent. You know, I really left the program, you know, thinking, man, I, it's a shame that these shows aren't on the air right now. Like these shows should be on the air. And I know this, right? Because I hang out with my community, but like the world doesn't know it. The world is missing out. So what are you up to mm-hmm. now? What are you what are you getting up to? So right before coronavirus, I became a certified Kundalini yoga instructor and Reiki did all this crazy shit. And you know, like my mom would be like, damn, like this is all heat and shit. None of this is 
for Catholics. So I'm like, mom, I understand that. Like, calm down. But like, it helped me to cope. It was crazy balls. Like right around Halloween or whatever, I start, stuff started picking up for me. And like a remolino, like it was just kind of like this whirlwind and everything. And I was filled with ideas. And it was so overwhelming that I had to like literally get my other notebook where I put like this kind of, and I just kind of wrote them down, right? I just wrote down like one, two, three, pop, pop, pop. And I was like, okay, which one's the one that I can't like, that I, that I can't stop thinking about? I'm like, oh shit, all three of them. Like, what's, what, what is this? And I realized the more I distilled them is because they were trying to tell a, a very important view and a vision from what's happening in the now. And so then I was like, okay, so which one's more feasible? Then I had to strategize, you know, and that's the other part. Like then I, again, this is really fun for me, but I strategize, which one should I kind of pull out the gate first? And so I strategized, I did that. And that also coincided with the NHMC, the NHMC program. And that's the one, um, you know, called Against the Odds. Um, that's what I called it. It was in the trades or whatever. And it just tells the story about raising my trans son and, you know, and there's an intersectionality to it. You know, there's a lot of people are seeing a, a sort of gigantic sort of um, explosion in, 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 in uh, yeah, in cultures, places of color, and people don't know what to do because there's nothing out there that really gives um, parents a tool on, you know, how to, how to raise a child who is not only trans and, and also in the LGBTQIA community and how they're going to be alienated or, or, you know, kind of like resented and all that stuff. And so, I kind of first looked at it with my own lens and like all the shortcomings I had as a, as a parent thinking I was a woke brown lady. That's bullshit. Especially not like there's no possible way I could have lived in my, in my kid's skin at all. Um, he taught me so much. I'm like, wow, like I'm a full human now. Uh, it's true. They say that kids grow your ass up. They do. They, they kids grow you up. And I wrote that from a very sort of vulnerable place. And I wrote that for the, for the fellowship. And I'm happy to say that it's garnered a lot of positive and fun attention and it's moving forward with the development side of it, at least that's like step one of like 20. So like, whatever, but like, knock on wood guys. But then I, then after I finished them, like I moved on to the next two. The next one was, okay, I'm going to hit this one out of the park for the studio that they, they've been waiting for me. These amazing like producers have been waiting for me. I polished, I wrote that shit and I polished it and I feel so proud of it. Cause again, the ancestors, the voices, everything came through because it was like, that's what it was. It was this kink in the, in the, not even in the chain. It wasn't a chain. It was like, you know, like a hose. It was like a kink in the hose. Like these voices were exploding to get out sort of like in, you know, within um, our consciousness here, which is why I think we were in such, under such pain and duress and why some of us weren't, weren't as, you know, either eating our emotions away or buying them or whatever, or whatever we were doing to each other, to ourselves. And so then um, I finished that and I'm very, very proud. Again, it's, it's moving along. People are like, oh shit, like this is tremendous. And um, that feels great. That's a feature. Again, very different from a t television, but having worked on both sides, having developed on both sides, like, you know, you have to compartmentalize and stuff. Um, and then the third thing I'm, I'm finishing now, and that is a elevated genre. Um, you know, that's the thing. Writers write, right? So like when, when you ask somebody, like, like I asked you before we even started recording, I asked you like what your the genre is and, and I love your answer. You're in a transitional, you're transitioning. And that's wonderful because I think a lot of times folks want to put themselves in a box. <laughs> so that's why for me, like my description of myself, you know, I am, I am ineffable. Like I am undefinable. I don't want to, because one, one moment, the moment I say I want something, I, I want to change it. You know what I mean? <laughs> or like, or I want to break that down because it's another box. And I, and I think writers write, and I think that humans, that writers in particular, that are the spirit of the times, I think we capture that. And I think that those voices live through us. I don't think it has to be a particular genre. And unfortunately, the industry model, the way it is now, is like, oh, no, you have to be a specialist. You have to, like, write in this genre. And that's tired. That's a very tired way of looking at it because not all actors want to, you know, and yet they're cast and recast in, like, the same sort of type of roles. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like it's a breathing. It's a living thing. It's like, certainly you have, you know, there's more experience in certain genres. Like I am very experienced in heightened worlds. Like there you go. Right. Like I can do that. But like, if I wanted to write like a murder mystery, you know, I'm going to have to read a lot of scripts. I'm going to have to do a lot of research, but I can certainly speak in certain voices. So I feel like, I feel like this is all a beautiful learning, um, you know, moment for all of us. Um, so it's great. Yeah. And so I'm always curious of who my guests are a fan of. So these could be 
writers that are heroes of yours, peers, friends, people you creep on Instagram? Just who are the writers oh that God. in the moment you're loving right now? <laughs> I love Phoebe Waller-Bridge. I just love her. I had the honor of like making eye contact with her and talking to her for like four and a half seconds as she was like ushered from one room to another. But I just told her how much I loved her because I, I didn't know what else to say. And she is, she is a, um, a peer, but I, I love that she's a playwright. And I love, you know, to your point, again, when we talked off of um, interview like earlier, I do love that sort of voyeuristic, um, you know, exploring the human condition all facets of it so she's someone that i i can't wait to see what she does with the, the new bond movie i can't wait i love jenny connor um as a showrunner nanashka khan as a showrunner so i think that she's so she balances like very young unco- she's now she's doing young rock um i'm impressed with how she enters like worlds that are usually hard dramatically but then she'll kind of like sprinkle it with like Something zany as shit. I love that. I love that. Um, I love Pamela Adlon. Her portrayal of being a sort of mother who's like tired and withered, but like so full of spirit is kind of exactly what I feel like on a daily basis as a mother. Um, giving of your entire bot, your body and your spirit. But like, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you, you have to also rebuild for yourself. There's like so many people I'm leaving out that I feel like bad even having listed those that I did. I like unapologetic content that just kind of shows you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, and it doesn't like explain itself. It doesn't backpedal to explain itself. That's the kind of stuff I like. And then of course your staples, right? Like, you know, there's so many folks out there that are doing, um, you know, your Jordan Peele's, you know, they're, they're doing your, you know, Dustin Simeon's, your, you know, ways like they're doing the work of like awakening and opening that door and like just kind of chiseling out and like there's tons of that you know and I want more of our people you know to come through that way I think we will I, I think it's an uphill battle because there's unfortunately a lot of infighting within the, the community but I but you know that's largely attributed to colorism you know the the caste system there's a lot of stuff there we have a lot of cleaning up to do in our own house with racism and colorism before we could like present a beautiful like deck of 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 like amazing stories that the world would be ready to see but whatever that's not and so where can people follow you on social media now i'm at you know so at side yazzy so y-a-z-z-y and then soup s-o-u-p like yasmin campbell like campbell like soup <laughs> and uh so it's at so it's at yazzy soup um, that's where you guys can follow me or not follow me, um, send good vibes, I'll send you good vibes. I like to ask my guests to help me title the episode. So the prompt oh. is a blank Latinx writer. And in that blank, you can put as many words as you want. You can mix them all around. Just whatever feels true oh. to you, the writing you do, this conversation. I also use it as a community building tool so that other people will see the title and be like, oh, that's like yeah. me. I should check this out. Oh, wow. I see. I see. Oh, I love this. Okay. A world building Morpheus meets Walter Mercado, who is also undefined. <laughs> I don't even know how to explain that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's the one. I'm Morpheus and Walter Mercado. I'm both of those guys. Yeah. I'm like if both of them had a kid. And look, I'm the same complexion. And with that, you know, I want to thank you so much for being on the podcast. This was such a fun conversation. 